to a certain degree, all three readings this evening have to do with dropping everything and responding to the Word of God. Even the second reading, with such audacious lines as, those who have wives should act as if they have none, is not an admonishment for all the husbands to go, yes! (laughs) But the idea is, everything should be a secondary consideration to embracing the gospel. There's an urgency that Paul is communicating to the people. Those who are eating should act as if they aren't eating. Hunger should be a secondary consideration to responding to the gospel. That's how important this message is for us to hear and respond to. In our gospel reading, we have the very familiar story of the apostles dropping what they're doing and following Jesus, at least the first four. We later hear of Matthew doing the same thing at his post as a tax collector. And we hear that story in the first reading in the reading from the book of the prophet Jonah. The people of Nineveh stopped what they were doing and responded to the word as Jonah prophesied to them. However, hearing it in the book of the prophet Jonah has an extra added dimension to it. We are all familiar with the story of Jonah, or at least with the fish part More people waste so much time trying to figure out if a fish could actually swallow a human being. Folks, who cares? We see traditions connected and folklore connected to Jonah. For example, sailors who have rough seas or bad luck at sea will often blame it on a Jonah, someone in the crew, someone on the ship who brings bad luck. If you've ever seen the movie or read the book uh, Captain's Courageous, Uh, Little Harvey was considered a Jonah by the fishermen. In the movie and the book Far Side of the World, Master and Commander, one of the midshipmen was considered a Jonah. Jonah is even associated in an entire sermon in the early chapters of the book Moby Dick. And it's usually associated with the bad luck of the sailors or something having to do with the fish. But the story we have, the part of Jonah we have in today's Gospel, is how the people of Nineveh dropped what they were doing and responded to Jonah's preaching to the point where God did not carry out the threat he had initially planned. If we knew that extra added dimension, we could probably understand that to a Jewish audience who first heard this story, they would have hated hearing that. Absolutely hated hearing that. First of all, Jonah is not a historical book, all right? So don't worry about whether a fish could eat a human being, folks. But it plays upon the history of Israel, and a very important history of Israel. Briefly, Israel was once a single united kingdom under King David and King Solomon. Following the death of Solomon, the kingdom split into two kingdoms. Two tribes stayed loyal to Jerusalem, the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. And that formed the southern kingdom of Judah, from which we get the Jewish people. The northern kingdom consisted of ten tribes that broke away. They formed the northern kingdom of Israel. Jonah, in the book of Chronicles, very briefly is featured as a prophet of the northern kingdom of Israel. You with me? The northern kingdom. Eventually, that northern kingdom was wiped off the map by Assyria. The kingdom and empire of Assyria conquered the northern kingdom, and those tribes disappeared into history, and that's why we call them the ten lost tribes of Israel. The capital of the Assyrian Empire was Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital of the hated empire who at the time of Jonah, the people reading, the author of Jonah, writing the story in deference to history, they would know that about Nineveh. And here's a story of a historical man, again, not a historical story, but at least for the most part, a man that at least was featured once very briefly in the history of the northern kingdom of Israel is now the character in which God is calling him to preach to the capital city of the hated Assyrian empire that conquered his own kingdom. What would be the expectation? Well, first of all, we can understand why Jonah would not want to go to Nineveh. Heck, let them die. Let God destroy them. They're the enemy. But God's ways will be carried out, whether Jonah wanted them or not, and eventually God led Jonah in the second half of the book to the city of Nineveh, 
saying, of course, that Nineveh was a vast city, three days to walk through it, but in less than a day, the entire city stops what they're doing and repents to such a degree that God spared the city. We can understand why Jonah would be a little disgruntled, that the city repented and that God spared the city. But to the reader, the irony of that is God spared Nineveh so that it could eventually wipe out Jonah's kingdom, Jonah's country. That's the historical irony of the book of Jonah. We waste so much time on the fish that we don't get the very unsettling irony of what it means to hear the word of God and keep it. God spared Nineveh so that it could eventually destroy Jonah's country. And that gives us pause. But what does that mean for people looking back upon the history? At the time Jonah was written, the history that it plays upon, it would still give a very sobering reminder to the people hearing this story. Historical or not, the message is relatively clear, if not a bit foreboding. God's purpose is served one way or the other. God had a purpose in sparing Nineveh. Therefore, God must have had a purpose in the Assyrian conquest. God must have had a purpose in the disappearance of the ten lost tribes of Israel scattering throughout the nations and disappearing into history. And Jonah could not accept that. Jonah would not accept that. Now when, of course, it's all hindsight, we know how the history turned out. Even the people who first read Jonah knew how that turned out. Then they could look back at their history with a certain um, lens of that basic faith. They may not know what that purpose is, but they know God must have had a purpose in that development of history. The prophets at least propose a certain purpose to it. Jeremiah speaks of it. Isaiah, some of the post-exile, post-Assyrian prophets of the southern kingdom of Judah speak of it. And every now and again you'll see a prophet basically asserting God, saying, you know, if I'm to find every lost sheep of the house of Israel, of the kingdom of Israel, is that really possible? They're that scattered, they're that lost. It's impossible to find them all. So I'll just simply save everyone in the entire world, and somewhere in there he'll find those lost sheep. So how do you find a needle in a haystack? You just load up the whole haystack. And that's a reminder of perhaps a purpose that God had in sparing Nineveh to wipe out Jonah's people so that they could be scattered among the nations. And then in his effort to find those scattered people, God just says, no, the heck with it. I'll just save everyone. And we see that in the work and salvation of Jesus. Starting in that one moment when he's walking along the seashore, speaking to fishermen and saying, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That's the beginning process of seeking those lost tribes wiped out by Assyria for whom God spared Nineveh. What was his purpose? Well, we perhaps are never going to know for sure. But one good clue is that the people of Israel were scattered among all the nations of the world so that all the nations of the world will be included in God's promise of gathering all people throughout the world to himself. And in so doing, he will find all those who are lost gathering all those who have disappeared from his fold. Because after all, one good way of saving those who are lost is by also saving those among whom the lost have gotten lost. So it's a clever twist that we hear. But it shows the urgency and the importance of hearing that word of God so that we too become among those God saves in his effort and plan to gather all the lost people of the tribes of Israel so that we too, of the people among whom they have been scattered, will find ourselves included in that gathering of those lost tribes. And it begins with that simple call that Jesus gives us that we hear in today's gospel. Come, follow me. And hopefully we too will be included among those fishers of men who will help God find the lost by those we've also bring into his fold.